Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, record temperatures roll corn growing on already parched ground, adding teeth to a century-old livestock rule, how one dairy operator changed gears to survive the pandemic. And market analysis with Chris Robinson, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, June 18 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Americans are spending money now on services and travel destinations and less in stores. Travel is the new it item as Americans take the wheel even as retail sales were driven 1.3 percent lower last month. Fewer auto sales also contributed to the decline. Now the producer price index, a key inflation indicator, jumped eight tenths of a percent in May as wholesale prices were led by rising food costs. Home construction rose 3.6 percent last month, even with builders fighting high lumber prices. However, lumber has lost half its value since peaking May 10. Creighton University's Rural Main Street Index kept above growth neutral for the seventh straight month with a reading of 70. However, the rating was down from May's record high. Now, many Americans would appreciate temps in the 70s. Instead, Hundreds of new record highs were set across the country this week. Now with drought conditions expanding, the lack of water is becoming more evident. Peter Tubbs reports. Record temperatures swept across the western half of the U.S. this week, while much of the Corn Belt waits for rain to ease a growing drought. Phoenix had multiple days above 115 degrees this week, and Las Vegas threatened records with temperatures above 110 degrees. The drought across the western half of the United States worsened as heat continues to dry out several states. Multiple wildfires in California flared up, taxing fire crews. The number of lakes and reservoirs that firefighters can draw water from for firefighting continues to decline. Crops in the Midwest are struggling to grow as subsoil moisture is depleted and temperatures hit triple digits. Corn in some parts of the country is beginning to curl as the plants work to retain moisture in the short term. Meteorologists fear the trend is going to continue even as rain showers and thunderstorms pop up across drought-stricken areas of the nation. You know, we talk about dryness begets dryness and wetness begets wetness. If you don't have any moisture for these thunderstorms to work off of, they won't go in that region or they'll just fizzle out. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. At least three lawmakers are wanting to sharpen the teeth of the century-old Packers and Stockyards Act. This would be adding a new layer of oversight with the aim at helping the livestock producer. Josh Bittner has our story. Farm State Senators Mike Rounds, John Tester, and Chuck Grassley recently unveiled bipartisan legislation to address anti-competitive practices in the meat processing industry. The Meat Packing Special Investigator Act comes on the heels of the Memorial Day cyber attack on one of the nation's largest meat suppliers, JBS, who reportedly paid Russian hackers an $11 million ransom to get operations in North America and Australia back online. The proposed bill will create a new dedicated office within USDA's Packers and Stockyards Division to enforce antitrust laws as they apply to the meat and poultry industries. Lawmakers and livestock groups, among others, say corporate consolidation has led to a domestic business environment where just four major entities hold the reins of U.S. meat supply, a situation which they say puts farmers and ranchers out of business and drives up retail costs for consumers. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. From adversity comes creativity, 
and ingenuity. When a door closes, another may open or some will just build a new door. The great pandemic caused many operations to pivot to stay profitable or in business at all. John Torpy documents a dairy that was able to do just that. This is our cover story. In the spring of 2020, the COVID-19 virus cut the power lines for the longest running economic growth period in U.S. history. Stay at home orders slowed economic growth to a crawl. According to the Congressional Research Service, between January and April of 2020, the nation's businesses shed more than 22 million jobs. In rural America, revenue streams for some small farms and businesses dried up. What we saw was a need to help some of our specialty crop producers or on-farm processors with a marketplace. Their, the restaurants that they sold to, the food service, uh, demand just absolutely fell off. And so what could be done to, uh, to help accommodate for that? You know, farmers markets uh, weren't able to function largely like they normally would expect. And so their marketplace was, was, uh, was uh, significantly disrupted. One Iowa dairy saw the economy deteriorating and switched into survival mode. The owners of the small operation changed their revenue model to focus on serving those in need. As one of the only farmstead-based yogurt makers in Iowa, Country View Dairy found itself uniquely positioned to keep its production line moving and continue to service their markets in seven upper Midwest states. As the pandemic spread, the company's 22 employees began sending products normally destined for refrigerator shelves and retail stores to coolers in food banks and schools across the Midwest. The USDA came up with the Farmers to Family Food Box program, which really benefited us in that we were able to actually still use some of that bulk containers and our smaller sizes and ship it out to distributors in the Chicago area and then they could distribute it through their areas of distribution there to get it to create these food boxes for, for people in need. Country View Dairy is a small farm operation located near West Union, Iowa. The dairy's owners, Dave and Carolee Rapson, are first-generation farmers who moved to the area in 2002 to follow their dream of owning a dairy. The Rapson family are members of the Mennonite and Amish religious orders and prefer to not appear on camera for this story. Country View Dairy narrowed its focus and began supplying just its yogurt to food banks and schools. As they filled the orders from various federal food assistance programs, the Rapsons realized their products were getting noticed in venues that had previously been out of reach. Normally we send yogurt to maybe a dozen schools and, and it was over 30 schools in Iowa. Schools we've never worked with in the past, so that was, that was great. In fact, it built some new relationships uh, and we've got orders for this new, new school year, regular orders for some of these same schools. So it's been a, it's really been, turned out to be a good thing there, so. Some of the new connections were made when the Iowa Department of Agriculture began encouraging schools and food assistance agencies to purchase local food products. The agency hoped to keep businesses afloat that were hit hard by the global pandemic while simultaneously helping those who were food insecure. And so we used some of the CARES Act money to help try to, again, reconnect, to, to connect producers with, with buyers locally. And one of those things was to incentivize or provide a, a, some match dollars for schools to be able to uh, buy local. And we know that many of our dairy producers in particular uh, took advantage of that opportunity and saw a tremendous increase in their sales. So right now we're functioning under the Summer Food Service Program. Up until the Jesse Sadler director of nutrition services for the Urbandale Community School District in Urbandale, Iowa, used USDA funds to help find local food products for her free meal programs. We received $10,000 due to the CARES Act money. It was a grant that we got awarded and we sourced that from Country View Dairy Farm and we brought the yogurt in and kids absolutely loved it. So we continue sourcing it. We're adding it to our summer meals and then starting next year, we're also going to add it to our breakfast menu. Sadler has continued to purchase Country View Dairy products even though USDA assistance programs have expired. Since March of 2020, 
her staff has handed out over 500,000 free meals at the seven locations served by the Urbandale School District. All right, there you go. See you on Monday. We're providing free meals to all students, free breakfast and a free lunch. But at the same time, we're focusing on the nutritional part of it. So we're providing all fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. We're making sure it's 100% whole grain. Sadler is using her recent purchasing experience as a template for procuring other local products. And then that way we make sure that kids are actually learning what Iowa local food is and we're promoting that part of our farm to school initiative as well. And our plan is to make sure 100% of the breakfast and 100% of the lunch menu is only Iowa local sourced items. So it'll be a big day. <laughs> Howard is happy about the part Country View Dairy played in supplying food where it was needed and hopes the new relationships built during COVID-19 will continue. It is going out with our brand on it. People are trying it for the first time saying, wow, this is, this is great yogurt. I didn't know such a uh, product like this existed out there. And uh, you know, a lot of these people have never been unemployed or they certainly have never gone to the food bank in their life. And, as things get better, they're going to be in a position to go to the grocery store and, and purchase the locally made items like that that they find in the food bank box. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market report. Algorithms and speculators made headlines while weather and policy debates factored as well into the trade. For the week, July wheat lost 18 cents while the nearby corn contract shed 29 cents. A record day for soybeans, lower as the biggest one-day fall on the contract happened Thursday. For the week, the July contract plummeted $1.13. July meal fell $9.90 per ton. December cotton decreased by 274 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, July class three milk weakened by 82 cents. A mixed week in the livestock sector, August cattle improved $1.52. August feeders added 385 and the July lean hog contract declined 11.30 or 9%. In the currency markets, the US dollar index increased 164 ticks. July crude oil expanded 86 cents per barrel. Comex Gold fell 108.10 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index dropped by more than 11 points to finish at 519.30. Now, here to provide insight is market analyst Chris Robinson. Hello, sir. Hi, Paul. So this dry story is a story across many grains. It might not be the story in corn or soybeans, but is it the story in wheat? For spring wheat, absolutely. I mean, you know, the areas where we grow spring wheat, they've been in a horrendous drought. Um, take a look at social media, you'll see some these fields look like, you know, the surface of the moon. It's the worst conditions for spring wheat, I think since going back to 88, I believe. That's the last uh, bit of information I saw. So we'll see. And that's interesting, you know, with all the volatility that we've had, um, actually spring wheat held up pretty well yesterday. If you were looking for, you know, yesterday being Thursday when we had the meltdown. Spring wheat held, held in there. So that was a sign of independent strength. And of course, we had the correction higher today. <laughs> so everything looked good. But um, I still think that that's it's kind of been the, the real drought story. And then it's building. As far as corn, you know, it's building because in the next couple of weeks, we've got pollination. Different parts of uh, the country have got uh, different levels of drought. Here in Iowa, they've got some areas that are D1 or D2. So it's going to be very, very interesting. And that's why you see every 12 hours, we have a whipsaw. Well, okay, you mentioned, you mentioned Twitter. Let's just bring the elephant in. It's full yesterday on Thursday of, oh my gosh, it's 101, 102, 199. But yet we drop a limit down. So to me, that says that's not a, wheat, a, a weather market. Was I reading something wrong? What's the, what's the mover in corn? For corn, I think, well, what happened on Thursday was, we well, probably won't know for a week or two, but something out of the ordinary happened uh, to have a move like that. And then also, you, you see today the recovery we had. Um, that was something I, and I've been on here since 1990. Uh, and I think we had one other time between that time frame when we had a limit down and a limit up day. So I think there was something else going on there. I don't know if it was long forced long liquidation by somebody or somewhere, 
or just everybody uh, that had been bet the, the one way got out all at once. That's the, the kind of the double-edged sword with commu computer trading. When it starts running, it runs, and it's different than when the pits were in, uh, open because people would calm down, but with the machines, it just goes. The algorithms, they don't know. They don't, they don't know, they don't care. Emotion. Yeah, they, they see value, and they're trying to capitalize yeah. on that. Okay, uh, the weather picture is something, and you talk about maybe something was amiss. Let's play conspiracy theory for a while. Russia, China, Biden policies, one of those three things. China changing their plan on what they want for the state companies. Yeah, that was the interesting thing. About a month ago, they said they wanted to curb uh, speculation, right? And nothing really happened. That was actually when we were at our first dip in corn. We had that little whipsaw down to five bucks and came back up to 628. But certainly on Thursday, you know, it was just a little article and, and uh, the state leader said that they were interested in seeing the, uh, the long positions of anybody and their state owned companies that had long commodities outside of China. Well, 12 hours later, you know, is it a coincidence that you have this huge meltdown? I don't know, but uh, it sure was, it just seemed like un unending selling. And, uh, you know, to finish the day down limit, and then as soon as we open up, you know, to come off, it seemed like it was, you know, uh, certainly something was amiss. So we'll see what that, what is, you know, down the road. So what do we do? New crop, what are we doing? For corn or for? Yeah, for corn. How are we protecting ourselves? First of all, nothing beats a good cash sale, right? And I was on a few months ago, and we were talking about, boy, it's going to be really nice if we get to see 430 corn, because that was, for the past three, four years, that was the magic number. And I think that uh, certainly a lot of people, when we got to that level, a lot of people got some cash sales done, thinking that that was going to be, you know, if you look back at the past six or seven years, that was a really good level to, to not let it get away. Same thing for $10 beans. And uh, this year was different. You know, and, and, and we talked about it back then. We started seeing extreme volatility. It really took off after the March uh, acres report, you know, when that uh, number came out. And that's sort of the setup for what's coming at the end of the month. You know, what happened to those acres? Well, we're going to find out on the 30th. Uh, but, you know, so 430 became a good price. Then I think people started looking, well, how high can it go? And this has been one year, I, I think, after seven years of not really having volatile markets where, it's really your only defense against making what you think is a good cash sale turn into one that you regret is you had to, had to reown it after the sale. And the only way to do that is either you, you buy calls to reown it on paper after you make a sale, uh, or you look for an opportunity to buy the futures back if you want to do it that way. But you have to reown it to stay in the game. And um, I would say, you know, in the next two, three weeks, with the volatility we have when we're having 30, 40 cent moves overnight, if you make a sale because it makes good sense to your bottom line, think about reowning it. And you do, the nice thing now is with these shorter dated options, you don't have to spend 25 cents or 30 cents or 40 cents. You can get a nice position on for 10, 12, 15 cents and stay in the game. So I think that that's the number one thing. If you make a cash sale, if. stay in the game. All right. All right, let's move to soybeans and I'll come back to a weather question in a moment. Uh, the soybean story, it is similar in some instances, but there seems to be something else going on. What is it? That demand. And also we've got the, that tight carryout. I mean, that's, everybody knows that. You know, but, but if this biofuels policy changes and the exemptions return or stay in place that we had in the previous administration, that might in, eat into some of that carryout. Yeah, absolutely. But I think you, the, the, the big what if is, is China, right? Start, China started buying beans from us back during the Trump administration, right? And then lo and behold, we had an $8 rally, six to $8 rally, depending on which contract you look at. That's a tremendous move, right? So that demand is really what's been underpinning everything. And we saw it today. Um, we were talking about it before we sat down. You know, we had a dollar break in beans and lo and behold, uh, eight cargoes left the Pacific Northwest going to China. So. If you've got 1.4 billion people to feed, that's going to be something that we're going to have to reckon with. And with a tight supply, no matter what happens with the RINs, um, I think that that's going to be the overall driver. And again, you know, are we going to grow a 4 billion bushel crop this year? If we have any hiccups in the weather, if we don't, then we really have a problem. And that's why you see this price rationing.
Well, we have a question about the weather. We have several questions about the weather. This is uh, Matt in Clara City, Minnesota, asked us on Facebook. You can only trade a forecast so long. Drought worries in June. <clears throat> dot, dot, dot. Is a correction coming in soybeans? Is this the correction? Well, it depends. We seem to have every 48 hours a correction. <laughs> That's really, which is, again, we didn't see this for six or seven years. It was kind of like, I, I, I was talking to one of my clients. I said, it's like being Rip Fran Winkle. You really didn't have this type of volatility for six or seven years. You get lulled to sleep. And now it's uh, something that we haven't seen and, and certainly with the uh, electronic trading. So I would say this, I, I would say, number one, if you do make a cash sale, if it's a good price for you, think about reowning it because who am I to sit here and say, no, nope, there's no way beans can go to $20 or whatever, whatever, you know, pick the price that uh, is most upsetting to you if you're a bear, right? I, you know, just pick a number out of the thin air. The only way to stay in the game after the sale is to reown it. I wish there was some other way to do it unless you have psychic abilities and can tell me where the high is going to be. That's the only way you can stay in the game. So I would say that. So, and, and then how do you play these markets? Well, if you've got unpriced grain, when the market rallies $8, right, from the bottom to the, then we had an $8 rally in new crop corn. Somewhere along the way, you should be protecting that, that grain. You could have protected $10, you could have moved it up to 12, you could have moved it up to 14. But at the end of the day, you're in charge of what level you want to protect. Um, and, and I think that holds true. And if we've seen it time and time again where we've had, you know, very, very inexpensive protection that has blown up in 48 hours. And then 48 hours after that, it's back to being very, very inexpensive again. So there is a way to protect yourself. You've got to get your risk on paper. That's the reason the CME and the Board of Trade were all built. You, you know, there's somebody there willing to take your risk. Let them have your risk. Well, the risk in the livestock market, uh, the cattle market, we're coming up on July 4. If you didn't get processed this week, it's not going to be in the store in time. The, the price doesn't seem to reflect that we're having issues slowing anything slowed at the packer. Oh, it's the thing. There's a disconnect there, especially when you go to the, to the store. So, and, but then again, if you look at uh, fat cattle, live cattle, you know, we, we've got really, really excellent prices right now. If you look at where we've come from and it's held in despite concerns about, well, is, you know, is the reopening going to continue? At the end of the day, you've also seen something else we were talking about, where this whole inflation trade, there's just um, a large part of the financial community wants to own physical commodities. They don't care if they own corn, wheat, beans, and that's, that's something where you're starting to see kind of sustained demand from not really the speculative funds, but the index funds, the index funds whose job it is to protect against inflation. Right, you're somebody that says I'm worried about inflation. You buy the index fund; they buy the basket. And um, there was some thought too that that's one of the reasons that we rebounded so hard. In after that sell-off, was that the index funds stepped in and bought that because their job is to protect against inflation. And if inflation is at two percent, and if, are we going to go back to 1976 and eight percent inflation? If it is. The only way to get in front of that are these index funds. So that may be something that's gonna, that we haven't dealt with for yeah. years because we haven't had inflation. So that might be a support. Are you expanding your feeder cattle to buy into maybe this inflation is going to be good for me? You know, feeder cattle, take a look at the long-term charts. You know, we're at five-year highs. And that's something you've got to take, take advantage of. And we've seen multi-year highs on all these commodities, 78-year highs in corn and beans. If we get back up to where we were uh, with crude oil at the height during the Trump administration, it was 76.90. We were four bucks away from that today. That's 5%. That's gonna be a seven and a half year high. So you're starting to see that commodities across the board are at six to seven and a half year highs. We're back to where we were in you know, 2014, 2012. That, that's, that's the area. Is that gonna last? You know, I hope so. <laughs> if you you're in the right those. position. So, yeah. Uh, also multi-year highs, the, the hog market. but Seven-year highs. Falling off that a little bit. So have we seen the high in hogs? I haven't pinned you down on that question yet. Have we seen the high in hogs? I hope not. Um, you know, a year ago at the bottom of the pandemic, we were at 18-year lows. You know, and that was a horrendous time to be a hog producer. So, I, you know, I'm on the side of the producer. I, I think that the market's giving you a great opportunity to protect these prices 
and you can reach pretty far out to actually like uh, June, July of 2022. We haven't been able to say that for a long, long time. When these prices get high like they are, the typically super expensive protection gets cheaper and cheaper. So it's something to keep an eye on. And guys always say, well, you know, what can I do? What can I do? The only way to protect yourself is to get your risk on paper because otherwise you're just with exposed to all the risk. So you don't want to let a $53 rally, and then we just lost 10 bucks. You don't want a, 50, a $53 rally, you lost 10 bucks, you don't want to see it lose another 10 or 15. So set a hedge. Setting a hedge does not mean you're getting bearish. You're being smart. You're being smart, and yeah. you're keep, if you do it right, you can keep the upside open. So Okay. All right, Chris Robinson, I appreciate the insight. We'll keep it going to Market Plus. How about that? Thank you. All right, good to see you. That'll do it for this installment of the TV show we call Market to Market. We will talk more in that thing I call Market Plus, so join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. Now, there's also this thing called YouTube, and it has something for everyone, including full episodes, stories, and our Market Plus. Subscribe by going to our page of Market to Market. Next week, we look at the possibility of eradicating famine. Thank you so very much for watching, and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.